question if you have um, if you have this handout uh, this will this will orient you, orient you for this session. I will mention this that on the bottom right hand side uh, you have you see two arrows and the name Mohammed. Uh, this is an error in printing. You'll be able to fill this in. Uh, uh, this does not have a full chart filled in. I'll give you just this word of explanation right now. These are not three different things. What you have in your hand are three expressions of the same thing. All right? So I'm going to go through as, as uh, rapidly as I can, but I want us to look at the, the contending uh, options in the global world. I'm going to do it by looking at the argument of the Apostle Paul in public space in an urban setting. Then we will look at the bottom chart, which on your handout is not fully uh, uh, there, and you can then fill that in, and then we'll look at the top right-hand corner, all right? So let's look together. This is about <clears throat> what are the options? What are the options for answers to the question, what is the best way to live life on this planet? The great thing about being in the 21st century is that in the global world, there are no more places to hide. In the global world, there, there are no more worlds of the exotic. Oh, you can find a few places, but you'll get there by airplane, you'll fly, then maybe you'll motor in on a, uh, across a bay or across a, up a river. But basically, there are no more places that are isolated. So for the first time in human history, we are at a time where all the options are on the table. You can think of it as different people being around the table. Have you ever seen an argument going on? You weren't the person arguing, but you listened to the arguments. And let's say that there are five people. I'm going to suggest that there are essentially five who survive and thrive in the global world. Some people would say, well, Tom, whenever I see what you're talking about, maybe there are seven. Okay, five to seven people at a table talking. Have you ever noticed sometimes that two people can be hot in an argument and this person says one thing and the other person says yes but this and this person here does not agree at all with what this person here just said but because you are stepped back watching both of them even though you agree with this person in your mind you're saying Hmm, that was a pretty interesting thing that that person said. You see what I mean? So what you have to, what I want you to conceptualize is that you have a table. There are five or six, maybe seven people at the table, and they're discussing. It's a part of the global conversation. Everyone's at the table. Every major voice is at the table. What I'm also going to suggest is that if you will just listen to people and ask questions, people will tell you what they're thinking. Now, for those who are followers of Jesus, because to have what I call worldview buy-in, worldview buy-in is another vocabulary for conversion. If I was living my life one way, but I think it through, and now then I shift, and I do worldview buy-in to Jesus and his opinions and his direction. If I say he's boss, if he's going to be the lodestone of my thinking, if he is my Lord, then one vocabulary is I've converted. 
another vocabulary is I just experience worldview buy-in. Are you with me? When you listen to conversations around the world, you will again and again find, oh, that's the voice of that person. It doesn't matter how they're dressed. It doesn't matter what their age is. They are, that person is expressing a voice of one of the persons of virtue, one of the worship virtue persons. That's why they think the way they do, and that's why they're acting the way they do. So, on the top of your uh, uh, sheet here, you have global history as expressed by the Apostle Paul. There are some six points in what he says. He talks about the one high God, the creator, the one human origin, the creation, the one human haunting, the conscience, the longings of humanity. He integrates this into one historical story, the calendar. He says that there is only really one hard date and that is the court, the judgment that is to come. And there is one humane person. There is one standard by which all of humanity will be evaluated, and that is the Christ. <clears throat> it can be expressed like this. In the Christian understanding of history, you have the Most High God, and then... History is shaped like an hourglass. All of history comes down to Jesus. All of history flows out from Jesus. In its essence, it's those, that is world history, and that is your personal history. World history eventually arrived at the turning point of Jesus. All of history has flowed out from Jesus. Not everyone agrees with this. That's the point. But in the, in the Christian, in the Judeo-Christian worldview understanding, that's it. All of history comes down to Jesus. All of history flows out from Jesus. That is not only the story of world history, macro history. That is the story of your history, micro history. Your life was lived in some reference to some things and someone until finally, in some way, your life came down to a meeting point with Jesus. Since then, all of life has flowed out from Jesus. Okay? So, from a philosophical standpoint, I want us to keep this clear in mind. So do it with me, okay? Are your hands free? Everyone, free hands, ready? All of history comes down to Jesus, all of history flows out from Jesus. Everyone together. All of history comes down to Jesus. All of history flows out from Jesus. I'm telling you, I can tell you are a very American audience. I'm telling you, you cannot do rote learning. But I'm from Asia. And in South Asia, we do rote learning. It's very fine. Very fine. So you now must speak up. I must hear you. All right? Everybody together. All of history comes down to Jesus. All of history flows out from Jesus. Again, all of history comes down to Jesus. All of history flows out from Jesus. One more time. All of history comes down to Jesus. All of history flows out from Jesus. Turn to the person next to you and repeat that three times. Everyone together, one final time. All of history comes down to Jesus. All of history flows out from Jesus. My mind mentors have been three people. Paul Ben Tarsus in his Athens Areopagus uh, speech, Acts 17. Wilhelm Schmidt, the University of Vienna in anthropology in what I'm calling the original memory of mankind. And uh, I'll just say, there are five stories. I've expressed them here, and we'll come back to this in a moment. There are five stories expressed by the sun, the cloud, the rip, the ripples, and the arrows. There was the Father, the Creator. There was a fellowship. 
the community. There was something terribly that went wrong. There was the chasm or the, uh, the uh, fall. There was the flood or the catastrophe and the filling up of the earth, the clans of the earth. But Wilhelm Schmidt at University of Vienna, through his lectures at Oxford University and other places, uh, clarified this in the 1930s. And uh, for those, as especially American anthropologists, are only now beginning to recognize what Europe has known for some time. And then Carl Jaspers, Carl Jaspers and Jaspers, the professor of philosophy at, <coughs> at Heidelberg University, he did a series of lectures at Yale University in 1949. His lectures were published by Yale University Press in 1952 called The Origin and Goal of History. In that, he dealt with what is called the axial period of history, the period from about 500 years before Jesus to the time of Jesus in which all the major worldviews of the planet were crystallized. And Carl Jaspers, Carl Jaspers' view is that there has never been a major new thought from the standpoint of how to live life since that time because those are where the persons of virtue are concentrated. These three people, he did a, and uh, I uh, have here, he did a picture of world history on a page. And I want to tell you that when I saw Carl Jaspers at Yale University draw history on a page, I thought to myself, wow, if Carl can do it, Tommy can do it, okay? So my conclusions are not exactly the same as his, uh, but, but the fact of doing history on a page is extremely helpful, and in fact, it follows the biblical pattern. So uh, let's see. I'm going to leave that there. Turn over, if you would, to the back of the page, and I'm going to take a moment to read 10 verses. This is from verses 22 to 32 in the book of Acts. I do this simply for us to have the same template in our mind. Paul arrives in Athens, verse 16 of Acts 17. When Paul was waiting for Silas and Timothy in Athens, he was troubled because he saw that the city was full of idols. The word is very strong. He was agitated. He was distressed. Remember, he was a... Jewish rabbi, a monotheist, who had now converted and was a follower of Jesus, who he now considered was the promise of God, the Messiah. He was troubled, distressed, because of what he saw, that the, saw that the city was full of idols. In the synagogue, he talked to the Jews and the Greeks who worshipped the true God. He also talked every day with people in the marketplace, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers argued with him. Some of them said, this, this man doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, what, 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 what is he trying to say? Others said, ah, he seems to be telling us about some other gods because Jesus was telling them about Jesus and his rising from the dead. Anastasius, uh, Jesus and Anastasius. Uh, Anastasius is the Greek word for resurrection, and it appears that some of them thought he was talking about a male god named Jesus and a female god named Resurrection, or Anastasius. Uh, so, but he's talking about gods. He was telling them about Jesus and his resurrection, the rising from the dead. They got Paul and took him to a meeting of the Areopagus. They said, please explain to us this new idea you have been teaching. The things that you're saying are new to us. We want to know what this teaching means. All the people of Athens and those from other countries who live there always use their time to talk about the newest ideas. With that as introduction, we come to his speech. First of all, the one high God, the creator. Then Paul stood before the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that you are very religious in all things. Notice, please, that he does not say, I see that your city is full of idols and it really bothers me. Okay? What he did was he acknowledged that they had religious longings and he connected on that part. 
no matter if he disagreed with them in the global conversation, his conclusions were different than theirs, but he said, I do see that you are engaged and there are longings in your heart. I see that you are very religious in all things. I was going through your city and I saw the things you worship. The word saw has to do with the word we get our English word theater from. I theatricized, I, I looked carefully like watching a movie. So I, I took everything in. And I found an altar with these words written on it. To a God who is not known. The unknown God. You worship a God that you don't know. This is the God I am telling you about. He connects their mythos line with his logos line. He connects their mythology line with the line of the truth that he has found in Jesus Christ. What you are worshiping as unknown, this is the God I am telling you about. Then he moves to the one human origin, the creation. God began by making one man, and from him came all the different people. I'm sorry, um, I didn't finish that. The one God, this is the God I'm talking to you about in the right-hand column. He is the one... He is the God who made the whole earth and everything in it. He is the Lord of the land and the sky. He does not live in temples built by human hands. This God is the one who gives life, breath, and everything else to people. He does not need any help from them. He has everything he needs. I want you to notice here that the Apostle Paul makes a contrast between the one God, the Creator, and the gods who live in temples made by human hands. If you want to do a word study in the original documents, you should follow through the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, on the phrase, temples made by human hands. Because the gods of the civilizations, Mesopotamian, Egypt, and others, were temple civilizations. That's what Rodney Stark, professor of sociology at Baylor University, calls them, the temple civilizations. So he makes this contrast. There is the one God who is the creator, and there are the gods of temples made by human hands. This argument was advanced for the first time in the Christian church by the man named Stephen. You may recall that this man, Paul, was the person who validated that it was proper to stone Stephen to death. They took their garments and put their garments at the feet of Saul, who later became Paul, and then they stoned him to death. So though maybe his eyeballs were knocked out, his head was crushed, his brain splattered on the pavement, the argument that Stephen had made was there is one God and then that you have even constructed your own religious systems, even you as the Jewish people, we as the Jewish people. That argument... This man stood by to see that man killed for it. But the argument of Stephen, in my estimation, was so powerful that it bothered, it irritated Saul's worldview until finally Saul had a worldview buy-in in which he shifted and reorganized his thinking and so that he became a person who uses the same argument now in Athens. There's one creator and there are temples made by human hands. Then, the second point, one human origin, the creation. God began by making one man, and from him came all the different people who live everywhere in the world. He decided exactly when and where they must live. I want you to notice this carefully. Luke gives us a summary. But Paul covered, he covered the origin of human history, he discussed migrations, and he dealt with time periods and geography. From him came all the different people who lived everywhere on the in the world, migrated to different places. He decided exactly when and where they must live. He deals with periods of history and places of geography. Very interesting. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. You see, in the global world, you go and meet someone from a different country and culture. If you go to the most remote village, that village person has to go to sleep that night in the village and ask, 
How did I get to where I am living the way I do? And how is it that I think the way I think? And how is it that this foreigner who just came and is sleeping in the next house as a guest in our village, how is it that that person came to where they are, lived where they are, and think like they do? That's why I'm saying we're in a global conversation. Everyone on this planet in this century has to ask the question, how did we all get here, and what is the best way to live life on this planet? This is what Paul is discussing here. The third thing, one human haunting the conscience. God wanted them to look for him and perhaps search all around for him and find him. But he is not far from any of us. We live in him. We, we, we walk in him. We are in him. Some of your own poets have said, for we are his children. We are God's children, so you must not think that God is like something that people imagine or make. He is not like gold, silver, or rock. I want you to notice this. Some of you, you have different disciplines. You're, um, you have a major in biology. You have a major in social work and sociology and education. Some of you are missiologists. I want to speak only to those whose right now major is missiology. But I could also address this no matter what your profession is. If you're going to be a doctor, if you're going to be a, a chemist, if you're going to be uh, in business or in education, it's irrelevant. I want you to notice that the apostle here in this public discourse quotes two people, two authorities, two Greek philosophers, actually perhaps the same Greek philosopher in different places in his writing. But the point is this, he had two quotations that the people of that culture, the Greeks, bought into and said, yes, we believe that, absolutely. Do you have, for the people that you are going to, the culture that you'll be engaged with, do you have at least two quotations that are not by a Christian, that are not by a follower of Jesus? Two quotations that are obvious truth statements. And when you do, you quote from their uh, folklore, from their poets, from their philosophers, and you say, your, your philosophers say this, I agree with that. If not, Here's my proposition. You should be sued for missiological malpractice. You are deficient. If your standard is the Christian Bible, then you are deficient biblically. The Apostle Paul had two ready quotations that he gave them in which they immediately said, yeah, we believe that. We believe that, that uh, we live in him, we walk in him, we are in him. One of the other poets said, we are his children. We believe that. And Paul says, I believe it too. If you do not have at least two to three, maybe four or five quotations from within that culture, in my estimation, I've already said it. You should be sued for missiological malpractice find them. The next thing, one historical story, the calendar. In the past, God, people did not understand God, but God ignored this. But now, God tells everyone in the world to change his heart and life. Notice, please, the Apostle Paul is giving this view of history. All of history comes down to Jesus, and all of history flows out from Jesus. Then, and now, that's how he divides history. Then, in the past, people did not understand God. But God ignored this. But now, since Jesus, God tells everyone in the world to change his heart and life. I want to mention uh, this. The word repent, that's used in many translations, has been captured into a spiritual, religious environment. When the Apostle Paul used the word for repent, it was not primarily a spiritual word. It was considered an intellectual word. So that when a person repented, they were a person who had heard different arguments and then went, huh, huh. 
and they change their mind. They change their way of thinking. I will tell you that in the global conversation, when you have talked to a person, the person says, huh, you've won the argument. You've won the point. And the point is, is to be able to so accurately state another person's uh, position and to be accurately able to state your position so people can see what we're talking about and what the difference is. And Paul, and, and, uh, Paul says that God now commands every person to think through their position until they go, huh, so they can change their mind and their life. One hard date, the court, God has decided on a day that he will judge all the world. He will be fair. And then he gives the standard for the court arraignment. One humane person, the Christ, that man. You will notice that the Apostle Paul will finish his speech and never use the name Jesus. He never actually named him. Notice what happens. He will use a man to do this. God chose that man long ago. And God has proved this to everyone by raising that man from the dead. Now, when the people heard about Jesus being raised from the dead, some of them laughed, but others said, well, we'll hear more about from him later. So Paul went away from them, but some of the people believed Paul and joined him. One of them who believed was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris and some others believed. When I was in Athens just before the, um, the uh, 2004 Olympics, uh, they had the, the, the runoff game between Greece and the Czech Republic. I had some of my Czech friends there. They asked me, who are you? Who's, we had just come from the Czech Republic. They said, who, who are you for? And I said, you know my heart is with the Czech Republic. But this is Greece's moment. And Greece won from the Czech Republic, and, and uh, Athens went wild that night. The next day, I went to the Areopagus and, and stood where Paul had stood. It was quite an amazing uh, uh, thing there uh, to see, and Greece went on to win uh, the soccer uh, in the 2004 Olympics. It was, a, it was a great time. But what's interesting to me uh, is that... Uh, uh, Dionysius is the Greek word that you get the Latin version, Denis, or Denis. Saint Denis, or Dionysius, is the patron saint of the nation of Greece. And evident, this is a reference to him here. He was considered to be the first convert of Greece and became eventually the, the patron saint of the nation of Greece. All of this is around one thing. The man who set the standard is the man that God raised from the dead. Think of it like this. It's as though if you evaluate all the people of the planet, who is the most outstanding? Who is a mountain above all others? Let me mention this in regard to Islam and Christianity. Islam says that you had Abraham, Adam as a prophet, then there was Abraham, you have Moses, you have the other prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, etc., like this. And then you have Jesus, and then you have Mohammed, peace be upon him. You have Mohammed. Since he is the last prophet, he is the greatest prophet. Do you see? That's the argument, the Muslim argument. Those who follow Jesus have a different understanding. They do not think of it as the last one is the greatest, but who is, in a sense, the tallest. Think of it as mountains on the planet. Once you reach Mount Everest on this planet, you have reached the highest peak of the planet. Does that make sense? If you continue on around, you'll get to Europe and you get Mont Blanc. That's a pretty high peak, but it's not as high as Mount Everest. And if you go all the way around a little further, you'll get to uh, Pikes Peak in the Colorado Mountains uh, in the United States, and that's very high. But Pikes Peak and Mount Blanc are not as high as Mount Everest. Does that make sense? And what followers of Jesus are saying is that within the world, all of world history, whether you were before Mount Everest or after Mount Everest, the highest peak is Jesus. Does that make sense? I think as a way of illustration.
So here's the thing. Uh, it's as though God looked over history and saw the different spiritual leaders. The spiritual leader of every person on the planet has been, he was born, he lived, he taught, and then he died. We now have his bones or his ashes. He was cremated or he was buried. His bones are ashes. Except for Jesus. Now, some people do not agree that Jesus is raised from the dead, but Christians do. So the life of Jesus is he was born, he lived, he taught, he died, but his grave is not occupied. There are no bones, there are no ashes. Buddha, ashes. Muhammad, bones, etc. But not Jesus. So it's as though God said, hmm, the Buddha. No. Uh, Mohammed. No. Confucius. No. Socrates. Mm. Jesus. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Yeah. Because the resurrection, Anastasius, is to stand up from the grave. We believe, as followers of Jesus, in Jesus and the resurrection, that Jesus stood up from the grave. And by that man, we have the standard for humane living on this planet. Relax. Not everyone believes that. I, I kind of get excited. Uh, did you notice? <laughs> Excuse me. Calm down. Take it easy. Right? But in the, global section, in the global conversation, that's the argument. God has determined a day in which he will evaluate all of human life. And he will do it by the man. The man that he raised from the grave. Without any disrespect, but only with respect to the facts of history. There has been no other that's even claimed to be raised from the dead. Perhaps Christians are wrong. Didn't the Apostle Paul use that argument in 1 Corinthians 15? If Christ is not raised from the dead, Christians are to be pitied. Poor thing. You poor thing. You believe that Jesus is raised from the dead. We know that's not true. So hypothetically, perhaps it didn't happen. Those who are followers of Jesus have become convinced that it did happen. So by that man, the man he raised from the dead, that human being is the standard for evaluating all of life in the understanding of Christian. Okay? That's our background. Now then, here's what I want to do. On the bottom of your chart, I'm going to give you two pictures of this. That's the Apostle Paul's picture. You have his outline. You can look at it in detail. Now I want you to follow with me. And on the bottom here, I'll go ahead and, and uh, let me show you what it's going to look. Oops. Uh, let me show you what it will look. Hello. Oh, that's not right. Hang on. Here, here is uh, uh, the chart, and you may have to see it all before you can fill it in. The understanding is that there is a base of primitive monotheism. Around the world, there is a memory of the Most High God, primitive monotheism. And then there is a pervasive animism. All over the world, there's a belief in spirits. I'm going to go back. I realize what I've done. I'm going to hook it here. There is a primitive monotheism. And then there is a pervasive, everywhere, people believe in spirits. In most of your 
discussions about worldview and such, uh, this is largely ignored. I believe in the global world, we're going to have to take it into consideration again. Let me give you the understanding of what I call the original memory of the peoples of the planet. I use the, uh, the drawing, the original memory, as kind of a, uh, a, a conversation box. It has five symbols in it. A sun, a cloud, uh, a rip, uh, ripples, and then arrows. The sun represents the creator father. Around the world, people have a belief in a sky god, the god of heaven. This god is ancient, and this god is far removed. But there was a time on the planet when there was a community, a fellowship. The aboriginal peoples of Australia call this dream time. That's why I'm using a cloud. They say dream time was real time, but it's not like our time now. It was a time in which there was uh, no disease, there, there, were, there, were, uh, there was no death, so the, but it was, it was community. Around the world, you have different versions of this. Some people say there were two people, a man and a wife. Some people say there was a village, there were our people, but there was a community of people who had fellowship with the high God. Then, in the stories, there is a story of a deep rip, a chasm, a gulf, a, a ditch that was formed. There was a fall. There are three common characteristics around the world in this ancient memory of the tribal peoples of the planet. It included a, uh, a food, a female, and a theme. A food, a female, and a theme. There was a food, sometimes it was a fruit, sometimes it was a vegetable, sometimes it was a drink, sometimes it was an intoxicating drink, uh, sometimes it was honey, but there was some food in this ancient time. By partaking of this food, or somehow or another this food, there, there was a female. Women or a woman often uh, is a key participant in this. Then with that is a fiend, F-I-E-N-D, not a friend, but a fiend. There is another personality. It may be a, a personality that took the form and the expression of an animal, so that in Africa, it is often a spider. In the Middle East, it's sometimes considered to be a snake. When you go to North uh, Asia, it's a, a, a snake with wings, like a dragon. If you go on over it, across into the North American continent, it becomes a coyote or a bear. By the time you reach the Aztecs and the Mayas of Central America, it becomes again a snake. But you will have a food, a female, and a theme connected with this disconnect. After the disconnect, there came to be death, disease, depression, uh, dissensions, uh, warfare, and such as this, all these kind of things. And there came to be demons. So before this, the environment of the community and fellowship with the one creator God was a protected community. But after the fall, after this chasm, now then they became surrounded by the animistic uh, spirits and the gods that were around them. There was a time of great catastrophe, a flood. You may be familiar with the writings of Alan Dundas of uh, University of California. Uh, his lecture is at uh, UC Berkeley where he deals with uh, the flood and the ancient peoples. You can go just Google on internet and you'll find there are over 5,000 stories that people have around the world in the memory of this planet of the flood. There was a time of a flood. It often had a limited number of people in it. Uh, and after that came the culture because after the flood, you have the stories of our people, our clan, we migrated and came to where we live now. I lived in Chiang Mai, Thailand for some time, and there are stories there where uh, people came wandering, following an elephant, and when he stopped there on Doi Sutep on the mountain, that's where then they built uh, the, the village and such. You'll have people that will say, uh, our people came to this river, and when we came to this river, our, our elders tell us that there they sacrificed a chicken or, or we sacrificed a goat or maybe we sacrificed one of the children of, of our clan. 
and we did a, a sacrifice to the spirit God. Then we went over the river, and now then our people live on this side of the river. We do not go to that side. This is our territory. This is where our clan is. We filled the earth. We migrated and came to this place. So all of the world, there are these five basic stories in the what I call the original memory of mankind. I want to say that more and more in the global conversation, if you will ask about those, you will be amazed. Because what the scripture talks about in the first 11 chapters of Genesis are the same things that are not written down but are in the oral memory of the peoples of the planet. Now, I call this the difference between the Logos line and the Mythos line. The Logos line is in the Bible. This is God's version of the story. The Mythos line are the oral stories of the peoples. Think of it like the Swiss Alps. In the Swiss Alps, you know, they have, you do yodeling. Yodely, yodely. <laughs> So you have the little boy, you know, he's out and he's uh, taking care of the, the, uh, the animals and such, and he'll yodel, 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 and the mountains will echo back. Now, an echo is not the same as the voice. The voice gives you the full yodel, 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 but the mountains give you an echo. In other words, you can recognize the yodel even in the echo. If the yodel is yodel yodel, you don't get an echo. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. It, if the yodel is yodel yodel, then the echo might be, but it won't be, it won't do that. So you have some matching. There will be distortion. There will be things left out of the echo, but there's a matching. Does that make sense? So, when you come to a people, you can say, here's a story that my people have from the book that God has. Yodel, yodel, And then the people will say, yes. Yodel, yodel, Ah, there you go. And so, I had a class, a master's degree class in urban studies. Uh, in Los Angeles, and uh, I was dealing with this uh, from an anthropological standpoint, and a person said to me, she was a teacher in Long Beach, and she said, I have been to Kazakhstan for five years. I take four months. I've arranged so I, I actually can take four months. She said, I've been five years. I speak the language of the Kazakh people, and she said, I have never heard any of this before from them. I said, well, I might be wrong, but let me ask one question. Have you asked them? And she said, hmm, no, I haven't. I said, well, you might want to consider that, but I might be wrong. Maybe they don't have any stories like this. She came back the next week, and this was in the days before cell phones. She said, I have spent about $400 in calls and talking with my friends in Kazakhstan. And she said, they told me, we learned after the Soviet Union collapsed and the Westerners began to come, we learned that even those of you people who are followers of Jesus, you don't believe in the stories of our people. So to avoid embarrassment for you and upset to us, we just don't discuss it. But if you're asking, and then they told her fragments and sections in which she could hear, and she came to class the very next week and said, this is what I've discovered. I want to propose to you that around the world there is an original memory. Wilhelm Schmidt, professor of anthropology at University of Vienna, he covered this in his writings he also dealt with it in his lectures at Oxford University at Manchester Uni uh, College. Uh, you, can, you can look at this if you're not familiar with it, but it is one of the most fascinating things that are there. And this is what I'm referring to as primitive monotheism and this memory, this ancient memory of the human race. And then after that, after the high God went away, after the fall, after the chasm, the high God receded in the background. So there's a memory of him, but there's not much contact with him. 
However, around the world, if a person is in danger, they can go past the gods, past the spirits, past all of the, the idols, and they can directly call upon the great god to help them. Uh, this is a common characteristic among animistic peoples. Zainer of Oxford University said there are not just, there's not just one holy people on the planet, there are two holy peoples. Most people are familiar with Israel, the Hebrew people, as a holy people. But there's another holy people, those of India and the Hindu. There are two basic systems on the planet for interpreting the data of primitive monotheism and pervasive animism. How do you take the data and interpret it? One of the ways is from Israel and the Hebrew people. The other is from India and the Hindu. What you have is that these two interpretations have influenced the nations of the world. How did they do it? The two results of these are Buddha and Jesus. And uh, this is where I am sorry, but I, uh, in my, um, I can't find <laughs> on here the, the, um, the diagram. What you, what you should do at this point is, you see these two, um, the two arrows? These two arrows belong just above the word Israel going up to the next column and just above the word India going up to the next column. So you would have the arrows, oops, sorry. The arrows would be just here going up. From India, by the arrow that goes up, you can put the word Buddha. From Israel, you can, by the arrow, you can put the word Jesus. It is very interesting that the message of Buddha began to spread into northern, uh, through Central Asia and Northern Asia right around 100 AD, about 100 years after Jesus. And the good news of Jesus was spreading at the same time. So both of them began to go. What happens is, I'll take the right-hand side. On the right-hand side, you have Christianity influencing Europe, eventually expressed also in Islam. It came to the Americas. You have secular America. You have postmodern, uh, the postmodern, the secular world and the postmodern world, and then the global world. On the left-hand side, you have Buddhism, which went into Southeast Asia, into Thailand, Malaysia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Singapore, all this area. And then you had Buddhism and, and Sri Lanka and such. And then you had East Asia into China, and from China it went to the peninsula of Korea and then to Japan, the K and the J. And then you also have uh, the influence of Buddhism on New Age thinking. China, you'll notice, is in the middle because China remembered the ancient high god, the forbidden temple in China, there by Beijing, uh, has no idols. Once a year, from time immemorial, Confucius said we can't even remember when this happened, uh, that the, the, the emperor would come and you had spring house cleaning and Chinese people would clean their houses and then they would go in and shutter their windows. Then they would turn away from the street and go and sit with their face to the wall. At that time, then, the emperor, who had cleansed himself and such, would come and go through the royal uh, pathway to the, to the forbidden temple, and there in that temple, which had three levels, but no idols, he would give a prayer to Shangdi, the, the lord of, he of heaven, the, the god, the emperor uh, uh, of heaven. And uh, it was an ancient ritual, no idols, just to the one god that India remembers from her, her past and her memory. This continued until the last emperor, 1913. And actually, the last person who gave that ceremony was uh, Sun Yat-sen, who was the first president of communist China, and he was uh, an evangelical Christian. What you have, then, is that you have 
two great voices, one coming from the Indian interpretation, one coming from the uh, Israel interpretation, from the Hindu and the Hebrew. You have Buddha and Jesus. What I do not have on the chart here above that you have actually on your page is Mohammed. And Mohammed is stretched there uh, across the ridge because basically it has influenced uh, that part from Europe over uh, through China, some of Southeast Asia and such as this. So you have Mohammed in there. So you have three people, Buddha, Jesus, and Mohammed that especially are the three persons that have emergent majority voices in the global world. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I want you for a moment now to think of just uh, the map of the world. One of the difficulties with Americans for understanding history is they draw the map wrongly. Americans tend to draw the map with America in the center. Okay? So you have California and you have New York. Then you go east and you get Europe. And then all of a sudden, somewhere around the Ural Mountains of the Caspian Sea, the whole planet is just cut off. <laughs> And then the planet starts, the whole landmass of, of Asia starts over here. And then you get Central Asia and China and Japan and the Pacific Ocean. America's in the middle. Uh, that's one of the major reasons why Americans uh, have a very difficult time tracking with history. If you go back and track the way history was experienced, this is the way we would draw the planet. <clears throat> You'll notice, for example, the discussions about early or origination. I have on here the, the, the core uh, discussions uh, from genetics and uh, the mitochondrial woman, such as this, where you have more or less northwest, northeast uh, Africa, out of Africa, or Southwest Asia, which is closer to the biblical thing. But, but what I'm saying is, if, if you look at these, and these are diagrams uh, from Stanford University and from Outlook magazine in India, uh, everyone has more or less agreed that history began in the nexus of the Northeastern uh, African, Southwestern Asian uh, focal point. In other words, Nobody is saying today that history began in um, Pittsburgh. Are you with me? Nobody says, I think history began maybe in Philadelphia. Nobody's saying that. So the, what you have is you have migration to the north and migration to the south. These are the flows that are pretty well understood today. This is a recent... Uh, uh, from 2009, uh, the picture from, uh, from uh, National Geographic, uh, the Genographic Project, the same thing as far as the... What I've done is to take this map here, and if you turn it on its side, you have sort of the migration to the north and to the south, and then the core of the continents. Here's what you have. You have an original memory, and then you have animism. You have hinterland north and hinterland south. You have belief in spirits. It is like a trampoline. Think of the planet like a trampoline. Underneath the trampoline is belief in spirits. It goes across from the north, from Siberia to South Africa or South India. It, it, it goes the whole length of the planet. Today, the tribal peoples of the planet are largely restricted to the northern and the southern edges. The great civilizations occurred in the middle of the planet, where the rivers were. Okay? So you have, I wish we had an English word called villagization. The villagization is on the edges of the planet, 
and the civilizations. So you have villages and cities. And the civilizations are the communities of the cities uh, developed in the middle. I'll just mention this about the, uh, the echo line. Uh, uh, let's see, no, I'm not going to mention that. But I will mention it. Okay, so I'll give one example from, from China. I do not speak Chinese, but in my understanding, and this has been confirmed, here's what you have. What do you, what do you have in a garden? Someone name for me. When you think of a garden, what's in a garden? Vegetables, fruit, trees, what? Dirt, yep. So here is, from some 5,000 years or so, the writing of Chinese. Here are the characters, the radicals that, that are included in the word garden. In Chinese, the word garden is a combination of the, of the radical for dust, for breath. Uh, one of the ways to talk about a human being is, here's your mouth. So that's the, that's the radical there, the breath that comes out. And this is two persons inside a fence. The word in the Chinese hieroglyphic, the Chinese and the Egyptians chose symbols and pictures uh, rather than an alphabet. So the Chinese word for garden is inside a fence, inside an enclosure, breath was breathed into the dust. You have two persons. Hmm. Yodly, yodly. Mm -hmm. What about the Chinese word for devil or tempter? Here is the radical for the word devil. It includes, notice, the whole word for garden. Inside the enclosure where there were two people, where the dust had breath breathed into it, there was a secret shared by a human and another personality. The personality might have been a human, but it might not have been a human. What about the word for tempter? When you put the word together for tempter, it has the word devil in it. So what you have is you have inside an enclosure where breath was breathed into the dust and you have two people, there was a secret shared by a person and a human being by the devil under the cover of the trees. That's a tempter. Yodly, yodly. Mm -hmm. What about the word for temptation? The word temptation is composed of the radical for trees, garden, and innocent one, in which there is whispering under the covering of the trees by the whispering. And then the one on ship or large boat. You know, today when you go to the Panama Canal, you only have a, something like, I think, less than a foot on each side of the ship, maybe six inches or so. It takes them hours to go through. They raise up the locks and put them through. And China is producing enormously large, and Korea producing enormously large ships. So the word for a freighter, the, a large ship, in Chinese, ancient language, it has to do with eight mouths in a boat. Eight persons in a boat. Now, I was at Oxford University and had dinner with the professor of history at Wuhan University and with another student who was doing on the uh, uh, hegemonic, uh, uh, the, the use of English as a political power in colonial period or something like this. So uh, we, had, we had dinner at Wilson College at uh, Oxford University. And when I got to this uh, part here, uh, the professor of history, I, I asked him, I said, if the word for large boat is eight people in a boat, why didn't, why didn't the Chinese say 80 people in a boat or 800 people in a boat or maybe 8,000 people in a boat? It just seems to me that eight people in a boat isn't necessarily, you don't have to have a huge boat, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, but that's how the conversation continues to go over. So you, here are the, these are the, uh, the things, this is from the Chinese language. I can tell you that all around the world, there are, I can deal, India, I'm not even going to deal with India's Varuna, the Lord of Heaven, such as this, okay. So here's what happens. 
if you take this chart, lay it on its side, okay, it more or less gives you an outline of history. Do you see? It's not perfect, but it kind of gives you the, the overall. So what you have is you have from the original location of humanity, you have hinterland south, a spread migration of the peoples. You have hinterland north, which goes north across Siberia, across the Bering Straits, and down through the Americas, etc. You have these two basic areas on the two sides, hinterland, hinterland, the edges. Okay? And then you have right here the Himalayas, or the Himalayas, as Americans say, that's India is like a ice cream cone, and the Himalayas, the Himalaya Mountains, are the ice on the ice cream cone. Okay. So again, we have all this. Let's see. Okay. Here is the overall chart. If humanity was in place by at least 20,000 years ago. By the year 2000, you have the great civilizations that have developed. And you'll notice on the right, the chart goes 2000, 1500, 500, zero. Then 500, 1500, 2000. So 2000 years before Jesus is the century of Abraham, the 21st and the 20th century. Abraham lived as far on the other side of, of Jesus as we today live on this side of Jesus. He was a 21st century and 20th century person. We are 20th century. You were born in the 20th century. You will live a lot of your adult life in the 21st century. So we're as far, we're, we're mirror generations in that sense. At this time, you have the original memory and then the hinterlands, and then the Hebrew, the Hindu, the Han, and it all comes down to the Hellenist. And you can see just above Jesus there is the Hellenist civilization. I'd like for everyone to stand for just a moment. I'm going to get you to Jesus uh, in about 30 seconds. Okay, everyone just stand. So here's world history on a page. Carl Jaspers did something like this at Yale University. I'm doing it at Andrews University. Okay, so you have original memory. Repeat it. Original memory. Now you come down to your shoulder and you go out and then go down and that is the hinterland. In the middle is the Hebrew people. The Hebrew. Now for yourself, use your right hand. The Hindu Han and bring it down to the Hellenist. So here it is. Just watch me and then you'll do it with me. Original memory. The hinterland, the Hebrew, the Hindu, Han, and Hellenist. Original memory. The hinterland, the Hebrew, now use your right hand, use your right hand, the Hindu, Han, and Hellenists. Say it with me. Original memory. The hinterland, the Hebrew, the Hindu, Han, and Hellenists. Again, original memory. The hinterland, the Hebrew, the Hindu, Han, and Hellenists. Again, original memory. The hinterland, the Hebrew, the Hindu, Han, and Hellenists. Again, original memory. The hinterland, the Hebrew, the Hindu, Han, and Hellenists. Original memory. The hinterland, the Hebrew, the Hindu, Han, and Hellenists. Original memory. The hinterland, the... the Again, you tell me. Again. That's right, you're down to Jesus. Be seated. Okay. The Hebrew people, okay, you don't understand that. 
If you migrate and go under the Himalayas, you come to the Indus or the Hindus River. And the people of India have for centuries and centuries been called the Indus or the Hindus. Han is the name that the Chinese civilization and peoples call themselves. So you have the hinterlands, the edges, the outback, the, the far areas, the village areas of the planet, north and south. You have the Hebrew, the Hindu, the Han. By the year 1500, 1,500 years before Jesus, you had developed priestcraft. These are the temple civilizations. These are the great civilizations identified with various gods, whether you were in Babylon or Egypt, China or wherever. So you have temple civilizations. You come down, and let me say this, temple civilizations are characterized by the fact that personal contact with the high God has receded. So now then, people need a specialist to get them in contact with God. The specialist is a priest. The priest is located in a place which became shrines and then temples. In the temple, he will do certain procedures or mantras or secret things, often by repetition. And you go to the priest, the priest does the ritual, and the ritual is then paid for. So those are the characteristics of temple civilizations. You have a temple, you have a priest, you have rituals, and you have payment or tribute for it. A repetition is so characteristic of the prayers that when Jesus was dealing with those from temple civilizations, he said, do not pray as those of the temple civilizations, those of the Gentiles. For they think by their mantras, by their many mutterings, by their repetitious prayers, they will be heard. A characteristic of temple civilizations all through history, I don't care if you're talking about uh, priest civilizations of Egypt, the priest civilizations of of uh, Babylon, the priest civilizations of Brahman, India, the priest civilizations of Roman Catholic Europe. Wherever you have priest civilizations, uh, you will have rosaries, the rosary beads, the prayer beads. You have them among Muslims who do re repeated prayers. Because you can't usually keep up with the same repetition, so you, you'll do, uh, if you're doing a Hail Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, by Jesus, and then you, you do one of your prayer beads, and then you when you do 10, the 10th one is a big bead. And then 10 more, big bead, 10 more, big bead. So uh, Buddhist priests have this and everything. They'll sometimes wear it inside, a, uh, inside a, a cloth or something, but they're doing uh, their, their mantras or their repetitious prayers. This is characteristic of priestcraft uh, spiritual experiences. By the year 500, you come to the axial period. This is the period that Carl Jaspers, or Carl Jaspers, discovered and wrote about from both Heidelberg and Yale University. He says that around 500 BC, there was a revolt on the planet. And people said, if I may be very common, we ain't gonna take it no more, okay? So what they did was there, there began to be explorations that, that influenced everything, and he would say, that from somewhere around 700 BC to about, he would even include maybe 200 AD, and sometimes he would go as far as Muhammad 500 years after Jesus, but it's rounded off, doing history on a page, it's rounded off as 500 BC to zero. This is the axial period. And approximately in that portion of history on this planet, every major worldview and worship virtue person was discovered and elaborated. There have been no new worldviews since that period of history. Gnosticism, New Age thinking, still goes back to the thoughts of the Axial period. So we may have modern iterations, modern adaptations, but they are all there, okay? What I wanna do is to draw your attention not just to the Axial period, of 500 years, I want to draw your attention to the axial generation. An axis is a turning point. 
On a car, an automobile, on a bicycle, you have an axle where the wheel turns. There was a turning generation. Is it clear to you that Daniel, Buddha, and Confucius were contemporaries? They lived within 50 years of each other. Daniel, Buddha, and Confucius were contemporaries, living within 50 years of each other. Did any of them influence the other person? Well, who was the oldest? The oldest was Daniel. And as the professor of history at New York University says, this actual period is so astounding, we to this day are fascinated by it, but we, we, cannot, we, we cannot understand how it came about. I want to submit to you that if you will look at the book of Daniel carefully, in the first six chapters, Daniel is divided into the first six, which is the person of Daniel, and then the last six, which are the prophecies of Daniel. In the first six chapters, the history of Daniel, you will find that the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, would not bow to the temple civilization demands. So they were assigned to be burned. There was one who appeared in the midst of the furnace, according to the records, that was likened to a god, a divinity, a presence of the Son of God. They pulled them out, and Nebuchadnezzar said this, I want you to write in every language and dialect of people doing business in Babylon. I want you to say that the Most High God, our God of mythology that we don't really do much with, but he's far up there, that High God is the God of Daniel. He is the God of history, and he is the one that raises up kingdoms and puts down kingdoms. He said, this is to go to the edges of my kingdom. The northern edge of the Babylonian kingdom connected to the Silk Road and went to China. The eastern edge of the Babylonian kingdom was the Khyber Pass, which then took you down into the Peshawar Valley and down to the Ganga River. And down the Ganga River, down the Ganges River, was a man named Gautama who became the Buddha. Let me see if I can find it. Let me, uh, hang on a second. Sorry. Here it is in the chart. You have Daniel. If you look at Daniel 3 and 4 and Daniel 6, you can see where the king Nebuchadnezzar and then King Darius did the same thing. When, when Daniel was in the lion's den, Darius then did the same thing and said, I want you to publish this in all the languages of the people. This message goes to the Khyber Pass down the Ganges River, there is Buddha. If it goes to the northern edge of that kingdom, it goes across Central Asia, the Silk Road, and you come to Confucius. Does that make sense? So, what you have is then history comes down in which every major worldview was identified elaborated and exhausted. Identified, elaborated, and exhausted. The New Testament understanding is that at the right time then, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. When all of the possibilities had been identified, elaborated, and exhausted, then Jesus came. In fact, the word used in the fullness of time is the word that's used, plumera, it's used of a pregnant woman. And whenever a woman's time for her pregnancy is finished, it's the fullness of time and the baby's going to come. You know, we had a little experience of that in our family since we'd had our first son born on October the 28th, and then our son, second son two years later was born on October the 28th. It was two years later, it was October, and on the 14th, my wife said, Linda said, Tom, uh, I need to go to the hospital. And I said, honey, dude, if you could just wait two weeks, we, we could have all three sons on the 28th. And she goes, Tom, get in the car and drive. You know, and goes, it was quite obvious that the fullness of time had come. Okay, so, so the, the point is, is that in history, when, the, when, when, when history was pregnant, when history was ready, now then, it was the right time in world history Jesus came. 
He came into a skeptical uh, uh, society into the Greco-Roman time in which people were questioning their traditions and tra uh, questioning uh, the way things had been done. It's very interesting that rationalism and revelation often find themselves as partners, okay? And you come to the hinge of history. Let me give you a definition of each of these. The hinterland, the animus. The hinterland, the animus, is the fearful, fearful worship of, of spirits. The primary person there is the shaman. What is a shaman? A shaman is a person who is a receptacle of spirits in a controlled way. It is controlled spirit possession. We have in the New Testament uncontrolled spiritual possession. We call that uh, it's like demon possession. If you make an appointment with your demon, oh uh, no, I'm sorry, I can't make it then. Okay, Thursday night, that's good. How about eight o'clock? Okay, I'll be there. What you do is you have a seance and you call the spirits by different chants, maybe uh, with aromas. Around the world, the, the common things for calling the spirits have been drums, dance, and drugs. Hi, hi. And at this time, then the spirits are called, and the spirit will then possess the shaman, the specialist. And the spirit will enter into the life, and now then the spirit will speak from the shaman. And it can give medical uh, recommendations, it can give hexes or curses or, or different information about the future and everything. And then once the spirit is finished, <laughs> It leaves the person, the shaman's body. The shaman is often exhausted and everything, but the seance is over. So this is the most widespread spiritual leadership experience in the world today. By the West, it's largely overlooked, but I will say that uh, in the global world, it's not going to be able to be overlooked as we go through the 21st century. The Hebrew monotheist is the faithful worship of God and neighbor. The greatest commandment is to love God and your neighbors yourself. The person who exemplifies this, the person of virtue, the worship virtue person, is not the shaman, but the savior. The Hindu monist especially has the self-discovery of oneness, usually through meditation and something like yoga or so. This is the sadhu, the person who sits and meditates and withdraws. I tell people in India all the time, that I do meditation, and they go, oh my, this is very funny, but I thought you were a Christian. You meditate. I said, oh, I'm sorry. You must think that I am doing Hindu meditation. Yes. You meditate, you empty your mind. I said, no, no, I'm sorry. I do a much more ancient version of meditation. I do the Hebrew meditation. And there I do not empty my mind in order to withdraw myself for society. I fill my mind for on these words I meditate on a daily basis. And therefore I'm renewed to be able to engage my culture. So the sadhu, though, has a discovery of oneness. I am that and that is me. There is oneness in the vibrations and the harmonies of the universe. And your greatest difficulty is to think that you are an individual. You're not. You're oneness with the one of the monistic understanding of all things, the discovery of oneness. The uh, Han people, the Chinese people, the Han people have always had a powerful understanding of the social alignment for community. It has given them authoritative leadership in their uh, political expression. But remember, Confucius was a government employed philosopher. And his philosophy uh, went back to ancient roots of the Most High God, but also was how the society can be aligned with the five relationships of the Father and the Son and the Emperor and the people, etc., and all the relationships, so that the, the society is aligned for success. The Hellenist is the isolated searching of the individual. This is the rationalistic searching of the skeptic, okay? These are your five basic positions. The shaman, the savior, the sadhu, the sage, and the skeptic. By the time of Jesus, all of these have been expressed. The shaman in the hinterland, the savior is promised in the Hebrew, uh, and uh, uh, it comes down, the, you have the sadhu in India, the sage uh, in, um, 
China. You come down to all of them being identified, elaborated with Daniel, the Buddha, Confucius. We've already gone through that. I'm having a little difficulty. Oh, I thought I'd been through that. Okay. So let me take you after Jesus. The good news of Jesus Christ began to spread, and it spread throughout uh, what today would be like the Middle East uh, into the peninsula, the Arabian Peninsula, up towards Central Asia, and into Europe. At about 500 years after Jesus, two interesting things happened. I'm going to use uh, a, um, a computer illustration. In Europe, there was a priest virus introduced into the program the gospel program. We call that Roman Catholicism. In Saudi Arabia, there was a prophet virus introduced into the gospel program. So that what you have is, you have a priest virus in Europe, you have a prophet virus in West Asia. Does that make sense? So that the priestly virus takes the core of the, of the early Christianity, but it begins to move it aside until it's more of a priestly version rather than just the common and the, the original version. You cannot understand Islam unless you understand that Muhammad had a version of Jesus. And for about a thousand years, Islam has never, was never considered to be a different world religion. It was considered to be an aberration of Christianity. If you look at today's terms, you would think in its view of Jesus that Islam is something like an Old Testament Jehovah's Witness. If you look at it from a revelational standpoint, it would be a Saudi Arabian Peninsula equivalent to the American Mormon expression with a prophet, revelation, etc. But coming down 500 years afterwards, if Mohammed died at 632, Pope Gregory the Great was crowned uh, in 609. So you have Gre Gre uh, Gregory the Great uh, expressly right around 500 expressing the priestly virus and then you have the prophet virus uh, with Islam. What happens is, is that from a spiritual understanding of Christians, you had God put his hackers on it. And there began to be kingdom hackers and there was one especially, his name was Martin. And Martin posted on his blog site 95 points. He said, you have a bug system. I'm going to debug the system for you. I'm going to de... You have a deformed Christianity. I'm going to give you a reformed Christianity. All you have to do is copy, paste. Uh, just copy, paste. So here, uh, salvation is by faith. Copy, paste. Uh, salvation is based on the Bible alone, not Bible and tradition. Copy, paste. And if you just copy, paste this into your system, you move from a deformed to a reformed Christianity. Now, there was a hub that tried to shut him down. Uh, out of Rome, there was a major hub, and they tried to shut him down. But he firewalled himself behind uh, the Wittenberg door, uh, a castle, and he kept on producing and posting stuff on his website. He translated the Bible. He did other things, he put out writings, and he was protected uh, behind the Wittenberg Castle and, and continued. And it went viral. It just simply went viral. It went viral with the printing press and such until uh, throughout, uh, throughout priestly uh, Europe and that system, 
writing and, and things among the people was considered a Protestant activity. At the same time of the Reformation, you began to have the Renaissance in Europe, and so with the Reformation came secular humanism. At first, as it said with the Open University in England, rationalists and those as revelationists, those of the Reformation and rationalism, they, they fed off of each other. So rationalists and reformers were saying many times much the same thing. But after several hundred years, they didn't just feed off of each other and gain energy from each other, they began to feed on each other and they became antagonistic to each other. So you have secular humanism especially expressed uh, in the French Revolution of 1789 and you have on the, on the chart, you have the Protestant understanding the Bible understanding, the, the like uh, evangelical understanding through the missionary movement spread to the ends of the earth. At the same time, secular humanism spread to the ends of the earth. So the view of revelation and the view of rationalism spread at the same time. So now then you have uh, not only the modern missionary movement, uh, you have the expressions of secularism with say CNN uh, others of, of, of a mindset that is very broad and very much bought into. We have the postmodern world, which now brings us to the global world, which is a reconnection with all the global realities. And those global realities bring us back to the major voices of the shaman, the sadhu, the sage, the skeptic, and the savior. The understanding of the Christian worldview is that there will come a time in the future in which Jesus will return. On the chart, it's expressed by a ragged thing because it's unknown when that will happen. But there's a confidence that it will happen and there will then be a new heavens and a new earth. Until that time, this message continues to go. Receptivity, according to the worldview interpretation, there will come a time in the future when there will be receptivity shut down. People will be less receptive to... Uh, to the message of the Logos line, and at that time there will be great distress for what Christians call the Great Tribulation that time will come. At that time, uh, people are to know around the world from a, from a Judeo-Christian worldview that it becomes time for there to be a new heavens and a new earth. This, in my understanding, is history on a page from a Judeo-Christian perspective. Not everyone agrees with this. But if you understand this, you can see the major players and the major deviations. All of these have areas in which they influence the planet. So that there are five major interacting zones that are happening on the planet. The zones of the shaman, the sage, the sadhu, the skeptic, and the savior. If you listen carefully to people, they will begin to express who they are and where they are, okay? Then you can bring forth your own conversation of what you have experienced and what you found to be good news for your life, okay? Questions? Comments? Okay. The definitions? Yeah, these here. The shaman is a fearful worship of spirits. It's very interesting, for example, I'll just take since uh, Madonna has uh, had uh, uh, national news in 2012 at the Super Bowl. You remember that Donna was Madonna was raised Roman Catholic. One of her first songs was Daddy, Daddy, Don't Preach to Me and she wanted to disassociate from her Catholic background. So she moved from a Judeo-Christian, from a savior mindset, but it was, remember, according to this, it would be a virus version. So it was not, uh, uh, in a sense, a, a, a healthy version, but it's a, a virus version, okay? She became secular. Uh, 
she is very obvious, she's very open about having many experiences, whether it would be sex with uh, men, sex with women, uh, drugs, and other things. She came to a place where her secularism seemed to have been defective, and then she became Jewish. She actually converted to Judaism. But what kind of Judaism was it? Does anyone recall? Who is her, her uh, rabbi? Kabbalah. She's Kabbalah. That is an occult or a shamanistic interpretation dealing with a lot of um, Gnostic spiritual ideas and numbers, etc., in the Hebrew scriptures. So she opted then to have a shamanistic savior version. Now, one of the most interesting things in contemporary spiritualities is that people feel the need to be spiritual but not righteous. What do I mean by that? If you do buy in to the Savior voice, if you become a follower of Jesus, you not only must think differently, but you must act differently. When people um, have, for example, various kinds of drug, sexual experiences and such, Many times people will want to feel better about this, so they, they search for a spirituality. But they do not necessarily want to change their lifestyle. So I want to be able to maintain my lifestyle, but I need to feel better personally in my personal integration. So you have people looking for hybrid spiritualities. I can combine and mix as I, as I wish. So hybrid experiences are part of the global world where a person does not take an exclusive, but, let me say this, historically, these voices are mutually exclusive and autonomous, and mixing may have some advantage on a personal level, but it has never been able to be applied on a wide systemic level. So you go back to the major voices. Yes. Sorry? Oh. Hey, um, are any of these presentations uh, available in any? Coming soon to a university perhaps near you. Uh, I, uh, I teach this with the University Institute. This is part of uh, what I've done in different programs that I've been involved with different universities. And I think we've had some discussion about maybe uh, having this taught uh, here at Andrews University, but whether or not I do different teachings. This is the summary of it. There's readings to go with it and everything like this so that you can just spin it out. I will say this. When, this, when you do readings from my course, you never read from a Christian until you get to Christianity. So if you're dealing with Buddhism, I only use Buddhist authors. If I'm dealing with Islam, I only deal with Muslim authors. I feel that we must listen to people. In a parochial world, before the global world, you went forward with your, with your exchange or your witness by talking. In the global world, you go forward by listening. And the longer you listen, the more you gain moral authority to speak. I'll repeat that. In the global world, you go forward in your witness by listening. The longer you listen, the more you gain moral authority to speak. I had an experience in New Delhi in which a person working with an interpreter from a person from another country, this person spoke to me, and in 10 minutes the person said, what do you think? I said, well, I'll tell you in a moment, but you just said you were bothered by that. What did you mean? And so this woman said, this is what I mean. And she went forward and she said, so do you, do you have truth? And I said, well, I'm, I, I will definitely give you my understanding. But you also just said that your uncle uh, had an interesting experience, but you didn't have time to go into it. I have time. Tell me about your uncle. She listened. I can say that the next day, 
talking to a friend who was a follower of Jesus, he said, I thought you were going to say something at 10 minutes, then at 30 minutes. At 45 minutes, I began to wonder what kind of a person you were. But he said, by an hour, I realized that you weren't going to answer her. I didn't expect you to listen for three and a half hours. But at the end of three and a half hours, this woman looked at me and said, do you know truth? And I said, yes, I do. If I'm honest with you, I believe she said, and you have peace. I said, yes. She said, would you, give it, can, would you give it to me? I said, no. And she said, excuse me, you have peace? I said, yes. She said, then will you give it to me? I said, no, I can't. And she said, why? I said, because I received it from someone else. He is the one who said, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives unto me, or gives unto you. I said, he gave it to me, and he can give it to you, but I'm not the person that can give you peace. This woman told me that she had had dreams before she came to India because she had heard me lecture. And she said, I felt that you knew truth, and I felt that you had peace when I heard you lecture. And now I've had dreams. And she said, I want that peace. I said, then you need to talk to him. And that's what we Christians call prayer. So if you'd like to talk to him right now, you can talk to him. And there in my home with her friend and my wife, myself, she talked to Jesus. And when she finished, she began to just, I, I, I can't even tell you, she was just like, it was, it, was, it was a beautiful time. And she said, I have it. I, I said, what? She said, I have peace. I said, did I give it to you? And she said, no. I said, who did? And she said, Jesus. You see, if I had spoken to her at the end of 10 minutes, she asked me the question, but she was ready with some answers and I would have done it at 30, even 45. But what I found is, in the global world, everyone's talking and very few are listening. Very few are listening. Listen to people. Listen to them. And you will hear the longings and the hungers of their heart in which they have searched and reached out hoping to find, but never quite. And in my understanding, those who follow after the man, the man that God raised from the dead, that man is what we're longing for. That kind of human life is what we're longing for. And amid all the options, I know the shaman, the sage, the sadhu, the skeptic, there are other options out there Let's be mature. We're in a global world. But there's only one who is the Savior. He died. But on the third day, he rose again. And our whole voice is the voice of Jesus resurrected. Point a person to that in the global conversation. Lord, we bow before you because you have really warned us. If we deal with intellectual things, you have warned us that we have an occupational hazard. We know that if people jump out of planes, their parachute might not open. Firemen who rescue others might be caught by the flames. But you've told us that knowledge puffs up. It is love that builds up. So Lord, we bow down before you because you are the Lord of everything. Help us, Lord Jesus, to think like you, 
to listen like you, to speak like you. Help us, Lord, to build up others around us by love, to stand for others in justice, and to speak truth at every opportunity. But Lord, you found us. World history is our micro history. We thank you that you found us. Someone spoke here, another there. Someone touched our life then, and another touched, and we felt the same touch from that stranger as had happened years before. And somehow the longings of our heart, the cravings of our deep life inside, Lord, they found, they found everything when Jesus found us. So we bow down before you and we thank you that in the midst of a world with all kinds of a cacophony of voices and suggestions and opinions, there comes a voice in the midst of all the noise, there seems to be a voice that touches us deeply. We thank you, Lord Jesus. For truly, in the deepest sense, we didn't find you. We confess you found us. So thank you for finding us. We are the little sheep. You are the awesome searcher and finder. You are the shepherd. Amen. So thank you. Thank you that you found us. Then help us to go with you to find others. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you like to know more now about how this conversation actually proceeds? We have one more opportunity to be with Tom uh, today at 2 o'clock, where we'll be talking about the J-shaped confession. And I think by now you, you realize that Tom is really <laughs> giving us a lot in a very short and compact time. And so I hope to see you back uh, one more time.